afternoon, everyone. My name is Monika Skonieczny, and I am the manager of the Trottier Institute for Sustainability in Engineering and Design at McGill. I would like to welcome everyone watching today's seminar titled Turning on the Heat, Developing Efficient High Temperature Energy Technologies Using Molten Salts, the, talk, the second talk in our TISA Talks seminar series this academic year. Before we begin, on behalf of TISA, I would like to acknowledge that McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. And while we all look forward to the day when we can host our seminars in person, in three dimensions, as we like to say, we continue to meet in a virtual setting as navigating the pandemic is still part of our daily lives. A quick housekeeping note before we start. After the presentation, we will have some time to answer questions from the viewers. So please feel free to enter them into the chat throughout the talk. We will have someone monitoring the chat and keeping track of all the questions. Or you can also wait until the end of the presentation um, and the first round of questions, and then we will give you a chance to unmute your microphone. And if you feel comfortable, you can ask your question directly if you'd like. So with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today. We are pleased to welcome Professor Melanie Tetaho fren who is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at McGill University and whose core research area is thermal fluids in sustainable and low carbon energy technologies, with a particular focus on advanced experimental and applied computational methods for radiative heat transfer in high temperature heat transfer fluids. Professor Tetro Fren holds a PhD and a master's of science in nuclear science and engineering from MIT as well as an advanced degree in music performance from the Montreal Conservatory of Music. So with that, the virtual floor is yours. Great, thank you, Monica. So I'll share my screen. All right, hopefully you could see this. All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining today. So today we're gonna to be talking about molten salts and their role in thermal energy technology and more specifically um, energy technology for decarbonizing the energy sector. So the first question that we need to ask ourselves really is why molten salts? So molten salts such as uh, chlorides or not just molten salts, but just salts in general such as chlorides and nitrate mixtures are very inexpensive and are found in everyday life. So for example, nitrates are used as fertilizers or chloride salts you have on your, on your table and you eat every day. So if I take some regular table salt and I heat it to some very high temperature, uh, so temperatures exceeding 700 degrees C, I end up with a liquid or a molten salt with some unique properties that are very advantageous for energy technology. So first things first, so Salts are typically very low cost. Some are, are a little bit more expensive, but the salts that are used typically in energy technology are very cheap. They have a very wide uh, operating range for temperature. So if you consider water at atmospheric pressure only has a, a range of 100 degrees Celsius. But if we look at nitrate salts, nitrate salts remain liquid at atmospheric pressure over a range of 300 degrees Celsius. And then chlorides, are double that, so they're liquid over a range of 600 degrees Celsius. And then they have very high heat capacity. So if I compare binary nitrate and water, the volumetric heat capacity of binary nitrate is actually three quarters the volumetric heat capacity of water. So combining the fact that they have a wide range of operating temperatures and high heat capacities means that molten salts enable energy technologies that have very high power densities. So some other interesting features. So they have low viscosity, which is good for uh, pumping, uh, favorable neutronics, which, which is good for nuclear reactor technologies. And they're relatively safe and non-hazardous, particularly the salts that are used in concentrating solar power technology. So molten salts are used in a lot of energy technologies. So the first one being 
concentrating solar power. So this is uh, the gold standard of, uh, so this is a technology that is uh, currently commercialized. So not to be con confused with photovoltaics, so in this case, concentrating solar power uses concentrated sunlight to produce heat for power generation. And so in this case, molten salts are used as the heat transfer fluid. So another example is advanced nuclear reactor technology. And so in uh, next generation nuclear reactor technology, many concepts include molten salts as either uh, the reactor coolant and or the, the liquid nuclear fuel. So this example here is terrestrial energy's integral molten salt reactor. And then these two energy technologies can be combined with thermal energy storage, where we can store excess energy as heat in molten salts to be used at a later time when it's needed. So it's essentially like a thermal battery. So we store excess thermal energy as sensible heat. No, so not phase change, uh, materials, but really just sensible heat energy storage. So if we take a closer look at concentrating solar power, so the way that concentrating solar power works is that there's a big field of mirrors, which we call heliostats, that concentrate natural sunlight hundreds to thousands of times onto a target. So in this case, in, a, in the, the standard tower technology, we have molten salt that's stored in a, in a cold tank that gets pumped to the top of a tower where there's a receiver and the concentrated sunlight heats the receiver. And this receiver consists in arrays of tubes with molten salt flowing inside. So the molten salt gets heated and then it circulates back down to a hot salt storage tank at 565 degrees Celsius. And then we could use the hot salt to produce steam to ultimately produce electricity. And the cycle continues. So in order to uh, uh, accommodate the variations in solar energy throughout the day, so the intermittency, this type of technology, because it's thermal power, we can, we can combine it with thermal energy storage. So the two tanks, the hot salt tank and the cold salt tank are our thermal energy storage tanks. So what happens is that during the day, the power plants are designed to overproduce so we produce an excess amount of energy that gets stored as hot salt. So the volume of hot salt increases during the day as we're charging our system. And then we could continue to produce electricity during the night and we're just discharging our hot salt that we charge during the day. So thermal energy storage is a, a mature technology. So it's commonly used in concentrating solar power plants. And the thermal energy storage is even though thermal energy storage is not very efficient thermodynamically, it's much, much cheaper than batteries, particularly at a, at a power plant scale. So this is what makes concentrating solar power competitive, particularly in sunny regions of the world compared to photovoltaics. So if we move on now to molten salt nuclear power plants, so there are a couple of molten salt nuclear power plant designs currently being developed in Canada. So the first one being terrestrial energy in Ontario. So their design is called the integral molten salt reactor. So in this case, uh, the molten salt is both the coolant and the fuel. So in a traditional nuclear reactor, you have fuel rods with solid uranium fuel and the fuel rods get hot and we have water that uh, removes the, the heat and uses that for heat at, for power generation. So in the molten salt nuclear uh, and the integral molten salt reactor design, what we have is everything is uh, merged into one. So the uranium fuel is dissolved directly into the molten salt and uh, is used as both the coolant and the fuel. And so, so there are some inherent safety features to this type of reactor. So first in a traditional reactor, you have to pressurize to very high pressures, which uh, introduces some, some safety issues. And second, if you have a, a, a loss of power and or a breach, the molten salt will just freeze and contain everything on site. So another example of a molten salt reactor technology in Canada is Moltex Energy. And so Moltex Energy has a slightly different design called the stable salt reactor. So in this case, uh, the fuel is contained, um, it's actually static fuel salt. So you have these uh, these fuel rods that have molten salt with uranium dissolved within it. And then there's secondary molten salt that removes the heat 
uh, and then sends it to a heat exchanger. And so there are many other uh, molten salt reactor technologies that are being developed all over the world. And so it is one of the, the leading concepts for the next generation of nuclear power. And so similar to concentrating solar power, these nuclear power concepts, uh, because the main energy carrier in these concepts is molten salt at very high temperature, we can also pair it with thermal energy storage for slightly different reasons. So we have thermal energy storage in a concentrating solar power plant to offset the intermittency of solar energy. So in this case, for nuclear power, the idea is that your nuclear power will provide your base load electric power. And what happens is that you can then integrate renewables into the grid. And so when your renewables are on, you can actually uh, store your excess nuclear power in your hot salt tanks when your renewables are on. And then at nighttime when there's no sun or when there's no wind, so when renewables are off, you can discharge uh, the hot salt that you stored from your, your nuclear power plant. And so these are all very promising technologies. Some have been commercialized, um, but there's still some challenges that remain. So these technologies are not fully mature yet in some cases. Uh, there's the scalability of the technologies, there's some uncertainty in heat transfer predictions, and the cost of electricity is not always competitive, depending on the type of technology and the location and the purpose. So today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the, the research that we've been carrying out to address some of these challenges. So if we start with concentrating solar power, so just a review of how it works. So this is an example of a, of a power plant. So this is Crescent Dunes in Nevada. So it's a power plant with a capacity of 110 megawatts. So the way that it works is this is this giant field of mirrors that concentrates the natural sunlight onto a receiver that's at the top of a tower. And so we have to pump salts all the way to the top of a tower and then circulate it back down to run through the power plant. And so, this complexity adds a lot of technical challenges and uh, increases the cost of the over, overall system because having to pump the salt through this complex net network adds some uh, parasitic energy losses and increases the cost of electricity. So over the past couple of years, I've been working on a technology that essentially combines all three systems into a single system. So our receiver, our cold salt storage tank and our hot salt storage tank are all combined into a single unit that is heated directly by the sun. So in practice, what this looks like, so here you can see, so this concept is called the CS pond for concentrating solar power on demand. And the way that it works is, in this case, we have a secondary set of reflectors. So natural sunlight gets concentrated and focus to a set of secondary reflectors that then beams the sunlight down into a big open tank of molten salt. So this tank is open, it's filled with molten salt and molten salt is semi-transparent. So it absorbs uh, the concentrated sunlight volumetrically. And so it also has two layers. So it has a hot layer of salt and a cold layer of salt. So during the daytime, the hot layer of salt is charging and is increasing. And then there's some passages here that allow the salt from each layer to flow from one side to another. So we're gonna look at what this actually looks like. So you can see during the daytime, there's a, uh, a structure in the middle that's a divider plate and is dividing the two layers of salt. So during the daytime, the hot salt layer increases as we charge and during the nighttime, it decreases as we discharge. And this is what allows us to uh, dispatch electricity 24 seven. So this concept was originally developed at MIT and then I worked on a collaboration uh, to set up a demonstration prototype of the CS pond concept at uh, Khalifa University under their 100 kilowatt beam down solar concentrator. So in Abu Dhabi. So you can see this is the prototype that was set up. Uh, and so this is the big tank set up under their beam down. And so this tank contains four tons of nitrate salts, which you could see here in the picture on the right. So this is salt being loaded into the big tank. And this is what it looks like once it's molten. 
And so the salt that we used is solar salt, and it operates between 220 degrees Celsius and 565 degrees Celsius. And so we use this prototype first. So this was the, the very first demonstration of a direct absorption, a direct volumetric absorption uh, solar receiver. And we used it to carry out several experiments to test the performance of the receiver. So one of the objectives of this receiver is what we want is we want to keep the hot salt layer at a constant temperature because we want to send salt at a constant temperature to our heat exchanger to produce steam. So in order to do this, we have to move the divider plate throughout the day as we're charging in order to maintain that temperature at, uh, at a constant, in this case, 475, 450 degrees Celsius. So here you can see the temperature profile in the molten salt for a charge between 350 and 475 degrees Celsius. So the objective of this experiment was to gradually heat the hot salt layer at a uniform temperature. So you can see each curve corresponds to a temperature probe somewhere in the tank. And uh, throughout the day, the divider plate would, would move. So we keep the constant temperature on the top. Now, one of the big issues here was that because we don't actually understand the thermal performance very well of the molten salt, so the way that it absorbs and uh, the, the flow of, of molten salt inside the tank, we didn't have any way of predicting what the temperature distribution would be. And so we essentially had some operator that was sitting there and, and manually moving um, the, the, well, not manually, but manually controlling the position of the divider plate throughout the day. So this added a lot of complexity to the system. Um, it also added a lot of uncertainty in terms of the design. And so we would like to be able to predict the uh, thermal performance and the temperature distribution in this receiver so we can automate this process and improve the design. So recently in my group, we, in my group, we developed a theoretical model that's able to predict the, the thermal behavior of a volumetrically heated molten salt. And we were able to predict three different operating regimes for the receiver as well as some complex flow patterns. And so we identified these three regimes and which one would be the ideal regime to be operating in for the solar receiver. And then this model will allow us to then optimize the design and because it's, uh, it's very fast. So in terms of real-time comp computation speed, it can enable digital twinning for uh, volumetric receivers, meaning that we can use it to uh, use the model to actually control the position of the divider plate. So automate that whole process. So the next steps for the CS Pond concept is to, now that we've demonstrated the concept in the prototype and we have our theoretical models, the next step that we want to work on is to actually develop a higher temperature um, CS Pond concept. So at much higher temperatures using chloride salts, which can operate at above 700 degrees Celsius so that we could pair the system with a supercritical CO2 cycle. So what we're doing now is we're conducting tests in the lab to optimize the receiver design at these higher temperatures. So first demonstrate it and then optimize it. And another thing that we're working on is developing lower cost tank materials, uh, which I'm gonna discuss in a moment. So here you can see this is our experimental facility. So we have what we call a solar simulator and the solar simulator consists of a, a 6.5 kilowatt xenon lamp. And so this xenon lamp has, a, has reflectors inside and it could focus the, the light uh, onto a receiver, which is located here at the bottom. So in this case, we have uh, a little receiver that consists in a, it's like a tank made of alumina bricks and it's filled with chloride salts. And you could see what it looks like when it's turned on. So we use this light to, uh, to melt the salts. And then we have temperature probes to then study the thermal behavior of the chloride salts. So those are the experiments that we're running for the chloride salts. And then in parallel, as we move to higher temperature, what happens is we, we start needing to use more exotic materials, which cost more and are gonna increase the, even though we're increasing the efficiency of the system, um, we're increasing the cost of the materials being used. So we're developing some materials as well. And so uh, just a little bit of background on this. So if we, if we look at molten salt receivers and storage tanks, so traditional 
concentrating solar power plants operate with solar salt at temperatures that don't exceed 565 degrees Celsius. So in a traditional thermal energy storage tank, uh, the cost of the salt itself is the main driver of the overall cost of the thermal energy storage system. When we shift to chloride salts, which are much higher temperature, are a little bit more hazardous in terms of uh, their, their compatibility with materials. Uh, the, the cost of the salts themselves is actually cheaper, but the cost of the tank material is much more expensive. So the overall cost triples because of this. So we need to uh, develop new tank materials to contain the salts for both thermal energy storage applications and for our CS pond solar receiver applications. So we've been working on developing these alternative concrete, mater uh, concrete materials. So why concrete? Because it's the most common construction material. It's a cheap alternative to low carbon stainless steel. And it can be engineered according to the intended application. So you could see here, if we just use regular concrete with chloride, so you could see this is a, a little concrete tank that we have in our lab and it's filled with chloride salts. If we just use regular concrete, the thermal stresses are gonna cause it to crack as you can see here. So we're starting to develop these new uh, concrete materials that could withstand these much higher temperatures and these corrosive environments. So we're, we've been de developing these little tanks in the lab that we've been testing under various conditions. And so some preliminary results that we have. So we performed some thermal cycling tests and some salt diffusion tests. So if we just consider common concrete, everyday concrete, or if we look at the thermal cycling, so we took our common concrete tanks and we cycled over 1.5 days. So we cycled the temperatures and you can actually see that the salt really attacks the common concrete. So the compatibility is not that great. And so we have some, uh, some issues here in terms of compatibility with, of the salt with our common concrete. Um, and we also have some salt diffusion issues. So concrete is naturally uh, a little porous and so it allows liquids to um, diffuse through the walls. So over uh, seven days of operation, you could see the salt diffusing through the walls um, and actually pouring through the sides of the walls because of salt diffusion. So looking now at our engineered concrete, you can see for our thermal cycling tests, uh, we have no issues in, in terms of salt attacking the concrete itself. And similarly, no issues in terms of salt diffusion. So we don't have this issue of salt literally pouring out of the sides of the walls. And so this was carried out for seven days of operation. So we're continuing to develop uh, these experiments in the lab with, for ideally with the hope of commercializing a higher temperature chloride-based uh, CS pond system. So now moving on to our nuclear thermal hydraulics research. So some of our, so basically the, the nuclear thermal hydraulics research was actually inspired by some, by some of the work that we were carrying out in concentrating solar power. So Based on our, our theoretical modeling, we found that um, that we did for the CS pond, uh, we, our models led to some interesting discoveries with respect to the thermal behavior of the molten salts. And most importantly, it highlighted that we there are a lot of things that we don't understand. So particularly because of the unique way of heating the salt, uh, we have flow driven by temperature gradients. And we have very hot salts that have some unique properties. So thermal radiation is actually very important. And because of this, a lot of traditional, um, a lot of the standard heat transfer correlations are not applicable uh, in, in these contexts. And so it leads to a lot of issues in terms of predicting thermal behavior. So just to go over a little bit of the, the heat transfer phenomena in molten salts, so essentially what we have is what we call radiation convection interactions in a semi-transparent media or what we call a participating media. So imagine you have a, a molten salt in an enclosure, as you can see here, and the molten salt has some temperature gradients as illustrated by the colors here. And so these temperature gradients produce buoyancy driven uh, flow. So natural convection that's due to the temperature density gradients. So in, in addition to the natural convection, 
every point inside the molten salt, these aren't actual particles, they're just points inside the molten salt. So every point can emit thermal radiation. And this thermal radiation is gonna be quite intense because we're dealing with very high temperatures, seven deg 700 degrees Celsius and, and so on. So every point is emitting thermal radiation. And because it's semi-transparent, this radiation it can travel within the bulk of the molten salt and get reabsorbed somewhere else in the molten salt. Or it can get reabsorbed or scattered. So we end up with this interaction between radiation and convection that's very difficult to predict. And it actually has some significant uh, implications in terms of the design of nuclear reactors. So if we look at our nuclear reactor design, that's, if we look at the, the design by terrestrial energy, so our molten salt reactor, we have molten salt that's flowing through the nuclear reactor core, and it uh, has uranium fuel that's dissolved. So if we have a loss of power accident where we don't have our pumps are no longer working, what we want is to be able to have the salt continue to flow via natural convection so that we can continue to remove the decay heat in the nuclear reactor. But if we're not able to predict very well the natural convection, uh, it's gonna lead to higher safety margins and more uncertainty in the heat transfer correlations and higher uh, uncertainty overall. So that's why we're trying to develop some new diagnostic tools to be able to understand this behavior a little better. So the tool that we've been developing is, uh, is particle image velocimetry. And so this diagnostic technique is uh, used to obtain the velocity field, the convection cells, uh, the onset of turbulence, and the turbulence intensity, because we've found that radiation will affect all of these um, in our molten salts uh, when there is natural convection and radiation interacting. And so particle image velocimetry is not a new technique at all. Uh, it's been uh, used extensively in low temperature liquids such as water or in gases. But up until now, nobody has actually used it in molten salts. And so everything uh, that we've been doing in terms of heat transfer, uh, understanding heat transfer in molten salts has relied on computational models. And so the reason is because um, molten salts are actually typically incompatible with almost all traditional materials that are used for, for particle image velocimetry, particularly at the high temperatures that we're considering. So if you look at, for example, a quartz sample uh, that you can see on the, on the left here, so this is an intact quartz sample, and this is a quartz sample after we've immersed it in lithium potassium chloride at uh, higher at elevated temperatures. And so you could see how the chlorides are really attacking the, the quartz samples. So we need to manage the, the incompatibility of the molten salts with a lot of the PIV materials. And so we're searching for alternate materials to be used and new ways of applying particle image velocimetry. So this is really the very first demonstration of PIV in molten salts. And so here you can see this is our experimental setup. So the way that it works is we have our molten salt that's contained in a vessel, and we disperse these particles inside the molten salt that are really good at scattering light. And we use some optics to produce a laser sheet. And so the laser gets scattered by the particles, and we use a camera to then capture that uh, scattered laser light and visualize the particle motion um, and use that to get the, the velocity distribution. So you could see our, this is our experimental setup. So our laser optics camera and our molten salt in our test section that we're using to study our molten salts. So if we have a look at some preliminary results. So this is uh, some preliminary PIV results for sodium potassium nitrates at 400 degrees Celsius. So you could see on the left, we have our raw PIV video. So you could see the particles. So the particles are tracking, uh, they're, they're following the, the motion of the fluid. And then on the right, you could see the processed PIV video. So we extract our, the information to get the velocity vectors and understand a bit better 
the, the natural convection and radiation interaction. So this is just preliminary results that we have uh, that we produced in our lab and we're continuing our work at, to reproduce these experiments at higher temperatures uh, in molten salts that are used in actual molten salt reactors and under typical reactor conditions and then developing new heat transfer correlations for convection molten salts with thermal radiation. All right, so on to the, the final topic that we're working on uh, in terms of uh, molten salts and uh, thermal energy technology. So thermal energy storage and uh, what we call power to heat. So a little bit of context for what we're working on. So if we look at Canada's energy profile, the electricity generated in Canada, we're all very proud to have electricity that's generated mainly using um, hydro and nuclear power, which uh, don't produce any greenhouse gases. However, despite this, the end use energy demand by fuel type is still dominated by fossil fuels because not all of our energy is used for electricity. It's only the small percentage here. So even though 82% of electricity produced from hydro, nuclear, and other renewables, uh, so meaning 82% is from uh, non-greenhouse gas emitting sources, 65% of the total share of energy use in Canada is from industrial and residential sectors. And these two sectors use most of their energy for heating purposes. And so 39% of the total end use energy demand in Canada is used for industrial process heat. And it's a lot more efficient at this time at least to produce that industrial process heat using fossil fuels than electricity. So the question that we're asking ourselves at the moment is, can we electrify industrial heat? So in order to accomplish this, there are a couple of challenges in decarbonizing our energy by electrifying our industrial process heat. So the first one is intermittency of renewables. So here we can see the Ontario energy supply. So this is the energy supply versus time of day for a few days in January. And you could see that our nuclear power is very stable energy output. Uh, and so it provides our base load. And then we have our renewables on top of that that are intermittent and our fossil fuels for power peaking. So that's our first challenge. And our second challenge is the variation in energy demand throughout the day. So we all know that us as consumers of electricity, we consume most of our electricity uh, early in the day and in the evening. And so if we start electrifying our industrial process heat, in addition, we're gonna add uh, a greater burden to our, uh, our electric grid in terms of these two challenges. So the question is, um, why do we need energy storage? So we need energy storage if we want to electrify our industrial process heat, we need it to balance intermittent renewable energy generation and flatten peaks in power consumption to reduce the impact on transmission. And so why store it as heat specifically and not necessarily battery? So as we decarbonize, heat is gonna make up an increasing share of electricity consumption because we just said that 39% is for industrial process heat. And sensible heat thermal energy storage has already been, it's already a proven technology, at least at the power plant scale. And we know that it can be a lower cost alternative to batteries and much more efficient to uh, store heat uh, if that's if you're using heat. And so the general concept here is what we've seen so far in this presentation is thermal energy storage uh, paired directly with the thermal power plant. So we had our CSP plant and our nuclear power plant that would produce excess thermal energy and that would be stored in these thermal energy storage tanks. And then when it was needed, we could send it to our, our, our steam generators and produce electricity to be then sent to consumers uh, and industries. Now, if we wanna decarbonize our industrial process heat, particularly in the context of, for example, Quebec, where we don't produce thermal power, we produce hydropower. So what we can do instead is our power plant sends directly uh, energy to the grid and then industries can store, they can buy electricity when it's cheap, when there's periods of low demand, and uh, they could store it directly as heat to be used on demand when it's needed for their processes. So sensible heat thermal energy storage 
as we mentioned, it's already a proven technology, at least at large scale. And so what we want to do is to define power to heat storage solutions to affordably electrify industrial heat at a smaller scale. So we need to adapt existing thermal energy storage technology to these new smaller scales and slightly different temperature ranges. And ultimately, we want to fill the gap in the market for 1 to 10 megawatts of heat for temperatures between 100 and 200 degrees Celsius. So the overall concept, uh, what it looks like, so we have our storage media here, and our storage media can be, for example, our molten salt. So what we do is we want to heat our storage media using uh, electricity, and then when we need heat for in industrial processes, we can uh, extract our, our thermal energy from our storage media to produce steam and send our steam out, steam out at 200 degrees Celsius. So on a first order, we're looking at what would be the cost of a storage system if we just directly scale down thermal energy storage technology using just off the shelf components at a smaller scale. And then we're looking at design modifications to make the system even cheaper. So if we look at what's the economic outlook for this type of thermal energy storage system, if we were to just build an off the shelf system today, and so we did a preliminary analysis, and here you can see the hard cost per kilowatt hour of an off-the-shelf system. So the dashed line is the estimated cost of batteries, and the three bars you can see show the price of our uh, thermal energy storage for four, eight, and 12 hours of storage capacity. And we th did this uh, initially for off-the-shelf system, assuming that instead of molten salt, we would use thermal oil. There are some trade-offs that we'll discuss in a moment. And so we can see also there's a separate cost for the uh, per kilowatt and the per kilowatt hour components. And so some findings, we find that the off-the-shelf design is uh, of our thermal energy storage system is anticipated to be cheaper than battery storage for daily cycling. And in terms of long-term storage, uh, we anticipate it to be much cheaper than batteries. So here I only have it for four, eight and 12 hours, but this is expected to continue to decrease for long, longer storage time. But the business case for long-term storage is also much tougher. There are also some other unknowns um, in terms of uh, storing heat for that long, particularly. So there are two paths to lower the costs. The first one is to optimize the configurations. There are some trade-offs and to develop some innovative components to simplify the system and lower the costs of the system. So some alternatives that we've been looking at. So the heat, the, the heat storage media. So we did our preliminary analysis for thermal oil. But if we were to use different uh, media, so for example, solar salt, which is very low cost, but the melting point is actually quite high. So around 220 uh, degree Celsius, which is typically above the temperature that we need for the type of processes we're looking at. There are other blends of nitrate salts, but these that have lower melting temperatures, but they're they're not they haven't been studied as extensively, and particularly for this context. So there's still some research to be done. There's mineral oil. Um, but mineral oil has a lower heat capacity, so slightly lower energy density, so some disadvantages there. There's also the possibility of having a filler material, so combining our, our storage media, our storage fluid, with some solid filler, such as, um, uh, such as rocks, for example, but there are some issues in terms of uh, structural uh, components. Uh, by adding filler materials with, with large temperature gradients. There are different uh, storage tank layouts. So we saw the traditional tank layout, which is in a traditional power plant that's used to keep salts at constant temperatures. We can have a single tank that's just mixed. So everything is combined into a single tank that has just that has a smaller footprint, but it can accommodate smaller temperature variations. And then there's a third configuration, which is a combination of the first two, but uh, so it's a thermal climb, so a stratification, 
but it's uh, more challenging technically to achieve. We did achieve it in our uh, solar receiver concept, but it does add a level of complexity. There's also tank materials that we can look at to decrease the cost. So conventional steel tanks are used typically for this type of system, but we're also, as I mentioned earlier, developing some new concrete materials uh, for this type of, uh, that can be used potentially for this type of small scale thermal energy storage system. We're looking at different ways to uh, charge the system. So charge meaning heating up our system. So the off the shelf method would be a circulation heater where you would uh, extract your salt from your tank and heat it up externally. So we pass it through a heat exchanger and heat it up and pump it into your, uh, your storage tank. There are some, so this is the quickest way of charging your molten salt tank. There are some alternatives which rely on immersion heaters and electrodes. Uh, these have, are, are slower in terms of uh, heating the tanks and they can potentially introduce hot spots if you try to heat too quickly, but they are uh, tech slightly simpler and might decrease the cost if we can design them in a way that uh, can still work for our needs. So we're continuing to uh, work on this and also to de develop some new systems for uh, making these types of thermal energy storage systems more competitive. And some key takeaways from today. So we've proven that uh, direct volumetric absorption molten salt receiver technology works. There is some work that remains to increase uh, the, this type of technology's efficiency and commercialize it. Engineered concrete is a promising alternative for molten salt storage tank materials. We've done the first demonstration of flow diagnostics in molten salts to be used for improving thermal hydraulics predictions in nuclear reactors and thermal energy storage for what we call behind the meter industrial process heating is feasible. Oh, and there's a, a broken sentence there. All right. So acknowledgements. So I wanna thank all the members of my lab, the Thermal Energy Lab and our sponsors of this research. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Kratofren, uh, for that very interesting and uh, actually quite fascinating presentation. So we will open the floor to, um, we'll open our virtual floor to the audience now. Um, I'll check the chat to see if there are any questions. I think I saw a few pop in um yeah we have a question from uh from the audience uh, from an operational standpoint which is a cost the cost driver the salts or the tanks it depends so uh for molten salts and uh thermal energy storage systems for csp plants for current the current generation of concentrating solar power the salt themselves are what's driving the cost but many uh, CSP technologies and people developing new technologies are aiming to reach higher temperatures and at higher temperature, the, what becomes the main cost driver is the material, so the tank material. So the salt becomes cheaper, but the tank material itself is what's the main cost driver. Okay, great. Um, we have another question. What type of molten salt technology does the Bill Gates reactors use? Uh, the Bill Gates reactor is uh, also a molten salt nuclear reactor technology. So it's another um, technology that is, so somebody mentioned TerraPower. Um, so it's also a technology that relies on uh, molten salt. It's more similar to the terrestrial energy molten salt reactor. So it's a slight variation on that technology. Um, another question that we have is uh, for your engineered concrete tank design, how does that concrete compare to the traditional concrete in terms of the CO2 footprint? That's a good question, actually. So we have some additives in terms of, so the concrete itself is uh, the same concrete as regular concrete um, with some additives in it. And that's actually a very good question that we haven't looked at in terms of the carbon footprint of the, um, of the actual materials that are added to the concrete. Okay, let me just scan the chat. I don't see anything else. I'm not sure if uh, maybe we wanna allow the people to, oh, I see something else pop up. Um, can you point to any specific industrial heat uses you've investigated 
and the scale of heat load and temperature? Yes, so one example we've considered, for example, would be a brewery that requires steam. And so, as I mentioned, we were looking at something like one to 10 megawatts in terms of capacity and temperatures. So ultimately we would like to produce steam because that's where we see the, the main gap in the market. And so meaning temperatures between 100 and 200 degrees Celsius. So that is a challenge because molten salts particularly the salts that are most commonly used are a little uh, too hot for that type of application, which is why we're also considering thermal oils uh, for this type of application. Question, can we ask questions uh, not through the chat? Yes, absolutely. If, if there's someone who wants to pose a question, yeah. go ahead. Because there's kind of a follow up on that. So you said yep. one to 200, wouldn't they look, be looking at higher temperatures to produce high quality steam? Uh, wouldn't that make it easier for them? To, for higher water. temperatures? Yeah, if they're trying to produce steam, wouldn't you need a heat source that's significantly above your so, end temperature? So for the actual processes that we're looking at, they, we're not looking at processes that require high, high quality steam. We're really looking at the, the lower quality uh, steam applications for now. That's our, our target for now. Can I, I have a, a quick follow-up question on, on, on that question. So I don't know if it was said in the presentation, but do you, do you know how, how much of the, let's say, energy consumption in Canada, those lower applications uh, they take a part of? Is it like the, the most, the, the vast majority of these processes or is it like a small subset? Uh, no, it's not a small subset. A lot of processes, I mean, uh, if you consider, there are a lot of agriculture applications as well that require these types of temperatures. So for example, dairy uh, farms will require these types of temperatures. So it is a substantial fraction, but I don't know the exact number, but it's um, not a negligible fraction, let's say. Okay. Awesome. Okay, we have another question from the chat. Um, there's a CFD software called, called Cosmo L, which is capable of dealing uh, multi-physics heat transfer, I guess, dealing with multi-physics heat transfer problems. Have you tried this uh, way alongside the PIV detection? Yeah, so actually, uh, it was actually by doing um, participating media simulation. So we used Star CCM Plus to do, which is also capable of doing um, this type of multi physics problem. And it was by doing these types of simulations that we started uh, to see the combined effects of radiation and convection. And um, however, it's, it was, it's very computationally expensive. So we can't do every single test case under the moon in a, in a reasonable time for, and in terms of design purposes, it, um, it's, a to, it's, definitely, uh, it's a tool that we're using, but we would like to have some uh, heat transfer correlations and some analytical models that will make it a little faster and more convenient to do some, at least some rapid design uh, of our, um, of our systems, essentially. Okay, great. I think we have um, Lucas Marone, you have your hand up. Do you wanna ask your question? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so I was uh, curious about the concrete as well. Uh, it has a, in the pictures you showed, it has like a very uh, smooth consistency on the surface. It looks almost like a coating. That's just the consistency of the concrete itself. It's just that like fine or, uh, Guess, no, yeah. so that's uh, part of our, our secret sauce that we're not going to say too much about it because we're still in the process of uh, publishing this. So um, uh, I guess that I would say stay tuned for some upcoming work to be published on this, but there are some additives and some coatings that we add to the, the concrete. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left, so maybe we'll take two more questions. I see one from Peter for the prototype in Abu Dhabi, were there any design aspects that were, quote, simplified or sacrificed for the sake of having a working model? Uh, I would say uh, many. <laughs> um, so uh, we had some, um, 
uh, I would say, uh, some issues with the heat exchangers. So initially, we were supposed to have a heat exchange or steam generator connected to the uh, the model, um, and that ended up being a greater challenge than we thought, particularly since this was an international project. Um, it also involved uh, a group in China, and it was a uh, uh, that was a big challenge. And so in the end, we ended up de designing a very simple thermosiphon for the, the prototype in, in Abu Dhabi. So that's one example, just one example of um, the prototype that we developed. Okay, great. And I guess we'll take a final question from Jocelyn once more. Do you know about real life binary chloride applications? Uh, yes, so Moltex is uh, using a chloride salt uh, in their nuclear reactor. So uh, they're a little bit more open in the type of salt that they're using. So that's one example of chloride salts being used. Yeah, so, so they, so they did, I guess, they, they do some, uh, some design, I guess, with the uh, steam generator part in this interface between like the, uh, the, uh, the salt and the, and the water for steam generation. So the way that Moltex work, works is they have multiple loops. So they have a, a chloride salt, and then there's a heat exchanger from the chloride loop to a, a secondary molten salt loop, which is nitrate salts. And then there's another loop from the nitrate salts to producing steam. So that's the slightly increased. Do you think this would be to avoid maybe too big temperature gradients between, let's say, the water and the very high temperature chloride salts? Um, Yes, but also Moltex's um, motto is to basically they're trying to commercialize this as fast as possible. So they're trying to use off the shelf technology as much as possible. So I, I suspect that one of the reasons was so that just use some uh, a lot of the technology that was already developed in CSP systems. And so it's to eliminate a lot of the new components so that they can commercialize as fast as possible. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, thank you to everyone for all the questions and thank you once more again to our speaker. Uh, this concludes our time today. Um, I hope that this conversation can continue offline for those that have any questions uh, can maybe reach out directly to Professor Tatao, friend. Um, with that, uh, I wish you all a great day. I'd like to thank my team for helping organize this event and hopefully we will see each other soon in person, <laughs> COVID allowing. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much, Monica. Bye.